I think we are on, we're live. Okay, everyone, um, however, okay, we're ready to go, we're on live. Okay, everybody, thank you I for the live, but I could hear my on. voice, so let me, let me mute, okay and um, we're ready to go. So everyone, thank you for joining us, our virtual art talks for teens and adults. We're gonna go around, introduce ourselves, and then we'll begin our presentation. My name is Maria Yoon. I, found, I started the private museum tours company, and I'm also an artist. Who wants to go next? Um. I'm Alex, I'm in seventh grade, and I've known Maria for a few years now. My name is Yasmin, I've also known Maria for a couple years now, and I'm a high school student in New York City. My name's Carlston, I am going to be a senior in the fall. I've been a fan since the beginning of the show, and Maria was just kind enough to invite me to the Zoom call this time. So, yeah. Hey guys. Yeah. Thank you, Carlson, for joining and thank you, everyone. So today we have a topic and we're going to do a screen share with you. So what's today's topic? It's all about pop art. What is pop art? It's an art movement that started in 1950s and then it flourished, it blossomed in 60s and 70s. And what do I mean by that? Mass media, advertisement, those were the images that artists have used for their inspirations. And no other person who used it the most, Andy Warhol. He really, you could see a portrait of himself. This is in his 20s. He had many, many insecurity issues. You notice his large house. He was so conscious of his imperfections, he never really fully stepped out of it. And also he has same vitus dance disorder, which is like that of seizure, like uncontrollable movement that you would like move. Um, so he was actually bullied a lot at school. And because of those illnesses and his insecurity issue, he was home a lot. And what did he do while he was home? He looked to magazine like this, mass media, advertisement as his source of entertainment and comfort. So talking about celebrities, mass media, magazines like this, can I do a quick polling with all of you? Whoever's live on YouTube, I know we cannot hear you, but you could use the chat box and maybe answer this for us. How does celebrity culture influence you? A, in politics, B, brands and body image and fashion, or C, voice for social change. Do you mind writing A, B, or C, whatever answer is for you? And we will wait for a few minutes because I think there's a slight delay. Yeah, um, there's a bit of a lag, but I think the four of us can kind of answer. Okay, so what? Which one would you pick, Yasmin? Um, I'm kind of thinking politics, like celebrity endorsements. Um, for a lot of politicians, especially for younger people, um, that definitely influences the way that you start to think about politicians. If you think about how many people supported Hillary in the 2016 election, how many celebrities did? Yeah, interesting. What about for you, Alex? Um, I would also say politics. Wow. That is so interesting. What about I say brands, body, image, and fashion? Because a lot of people, my peers, my age, we see like celebrities as like this sort of um, outlet for quote unquote tea or like scandals or like whatnots. It's just things that are interesting, I guess. And then images and fashion, obviously, for the way they dress and everything, we look at that too. Yeah. 
And but for me, it's the C, voice for social change, because I want that. I, I look for that. So all of us had to, two of you chose A in politics. So interesting to see. Okay, we're going to check back with the audience who's joining us on YouTube. And hopefully one of these days we could have you join us on Zoom as well. Unless, is there any comments um, that Yasmin, you could see from? Um, not as of yet, but I'll let you know if there are. Okay, great. So going back to Andy Warhol, he grew up right before the Great Depression, 1928. He grew up very, very poor. So imagine they couldn't at some point even afford to buy Campbell's tomato soup. His brother would have to make them squeeze it out of ketchup and mixing water to make tomato soup out of that. Oh, I could only imagine the taste, right? But overcoming, you know, poverty, his insecurities, and then also he's embracing his disorder. And how do you work with that? His mother was very instrumental for overcoming all of those things. And I decided to choose this selfie to share with you to, 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 um, to, to get to know the Andy Warhol a little bit more. Um, what do you notice about these series of self-portraits? He's wearing wigs. I read it somewhere. He had over 100 different collection of wigs and imagine changing them depending on what your moods were per day, right? But if you use your eyes a little bit more closely, you see that he has yellow colored wigs here. Over here, it's a little bit more flamboyant, but it's silvery tone. Can you see that? Right? Yeah. And then different length and different, you know, style slightly, you know, different from one to another. And I look at this and I think he would have embraced Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, all of the social <laughs> media. He's really creative. Yeah. Would, him and I would have been like best friends if we went to high school together. <laughs> Seriously. But again, remember he was very much bullied in school. So he hated school. But somebody who was bullied in school, he's using selfies to talk about his imperfection. So he's wearing wigs. Why is he wearing wigs? He also had hair thinning problem. So that was another reason why he wore wigs to cover himself, but he decided to do it in this playful way. And speaking of playfulness, he called his studio the factory. And it is there he was producing movies, having parties, lots of it. So he was definitely a party boy. How did he become shy, insecure boy, become a party boy? I think he became successful. But Yasmin, what were you going to say? Oh, I think it goes back to the wigs. Like you were talking about how he was bullied as a child and his, and if you look at his old picture, um, very much the stereotypical kind of nerd archetype. But also if you think about how he, disguises himself and kind of wears really flamboyant clothes and lives a very like flamboyant life. That kind of way he disguises himself that he feels more almost enabled to kind of be a different version or a more outspoken version of himself. Yeah, he did. And, but also he, by the time he did self portrait series like this, he had already became so successful. He was making decent amount of money as an illustrator after moving from Pittsburgh in the slum of Pittsburgh to New York City and he landed. Great job working well, for fashion look, magazine. For this, I I think he was he was just highlighting all his like imperfections, I feel like he he was like kind of using his imperfections as like um as beauty actually like in reality just beauty because look at it for the second row the left picture you see a no filter no flash meanwhile the one towards the right, there's like a flash and everything. Um, the nose is highlighted in the one towards the right and the one onto the left. It's just there with no color, making it seem bigger than it actually is. And then, yeah, well, we talked about the hair earlier, the, the different, you know, different ways it shapes and forms and everything. That is fascinating. Yeah, so like I said, he, I feel like he's highlighting his imperfections 
to market beauty almost like to showcase beauty standards. That's good. That's really good. Well, he certainly did that and he decided to produce mass amount of it by creating silk screens like this. I think we all own a shirt that's silk screened, especially like I love New York, you know? So, um, and in this one, he's really having fun with himself, right? And look at his slight differences in expression. But my personal favorite is this one. He's really camouflaging himself, but not with the greenish background colors that we know camouflage as, but using pink, yellow, and blue, and but keeping himself still in hiding almost, like filtering. I mean, this is like today's version on Instagram, filtering, isn't it, right? So he's using all of those elements to reinvent himself. And he certainly did reinvent himself that he has stalkers, like people that were obsessed with him. And look at the headline here. She said, he controlled my life. Who is she? She is the actress who shot Andy Warhol. <laughs> she also was battling with mental illness. So this is another reason she almost killed him. Her name is Valerie Solanas. And she was also a feminist, but it's proven later on that she did struggle with mental illness. And this is his last self-portrait I wanna share with you, which is him trying to readjust to his injury after being shot at by Valerie. So here you can see his paint stroke marks a little bit more, less of a silk screen. Here, here's more hen gestural strokes and paint. What do you guys think about this? Any thoughts or comments? I like how he's kind of see like there are multiple versions, especially in that self portrait, um, kind of how you see multiple versions of himself. It's not like as kind of direct as the images. There's, a, there's not just one way to see it. There are multiple personas that you kind of have to grapple with when you look, confront this image. And then I wanna share this last statement with you. If you wanna know about Andy Warhol, just look at the surface of my pictures, my movies and me, and there I am. There's nothing in between. Okay, unless we have any questions or comments, please our YouTube audience Go ahead and write them if you have them and we will come back to you. We'll circle back at the end of the presentation. Next is going to be Alex presenting. <laughs> and I put <laughs> Alex's profile picture here because she's in Connecticut right now and their internet was not so reliable because of the hurricane we just had four days ago. So here she is. And her chosen painting happens to be that of uh, Marilyn Monroe. Alex, you wanna take it away, it's yours. Okay, so Marilyn was um, smart, but stereotypically um, she was identified as one of those um, bimbo blondes. And she got famous of uh, being a sex symbol, even though she did, um, she was intelligent and she was also very good friends with John F. Kennedy. And um, she is colored. Um, she got famous off of other people's opinions. And I feel like um, Andy Warhol chose to put her in a bunch of different colors to see all of her different personalities, possibly like in this picture shown here, to see yeah. all of the different angles and like personas that could be in terms of. I don't, I don't, um, can you just elaborate on what do you mean she got famous off of other people's opinions? Um, sure. So everyone, I'm sure you've heard Marilyn was more known for her looks than her um, actual personality. She got famous off of being a sex symbol, like for her looks only and not, like I said, of her personality. So that she wasn't really judged fairly. And uh, that's how she got famous because, yeah. 
So she was also an actress. She was smart. And people didn't want to see that because of her beauty was just uh, overpowering. So I think um, Alex is talking about what they saw instead of really getting to see her inside and understanding how intelligent this woman was, right? So um, that is quite interesting. But you also chose Alex, um, Lady Gaga, right? Yes. And this is clearly um, him next to Lady Gaga only as a comparison. But um, this is not made by Andy Warhol, but other artists today are using his technique and style to show Lady Gaga like this. And I think, Alex, you chose this particular image for your presentation. Why? Um, I thought that people were carrying on Andy's legacy and adding their own modern touch to society these days, like Madonna and Audrey Hepburn. Um, those are some other famous ones. Um, yeah, it's like, I don't know, I guess it's just carrying on his legacy. Yeah, and look, they're still in still love with it. They're selling it right now as an art print for $21.89. So yeah. it's interesting, people have never really forgotten about him. And then of course, I put this picture in here because this is how I always forever think of Lady Gaga with her meat dress. <laughs> I, could smell the I could smell the picture from here. <laughs> <laughs> me too. And this is what's always haunted me, I guess, in a good or bad ways. But um, often she is very much compared with Andy Warhol. So good and choice. For Audrey Hepburn, yeah, hold on. Yep. Um, society has grown since then. And instead of just symbolizing her as a sex symbol anymore, she's idealized for feminality. And she was respectful and polite. Instead of just Mar like Marilyn um, judged based on her looks and not her personality and her background. Yeah. You got it. Yeah, it's certainly interesting to see that. If I could just add one more thing about this golden color Marilyn Monroe. I don't know if any of you knew, but Mandy Warhol was Catholic churchgoer when he was a young boy. And he would spend an average of eight hours on Sunday worshiping, praying, singing. And can you imagine going to church for eight hours? Okay. <laughs> I understand we have devotion in many different ways, but what do you think he was looking at in the church? What do we see a lot of in the church, especially if you're Catholic? Um, you see a lot of idols. Yeah, exactly. Saints, right? So I'm sure he's looked at them more than plenty. And this golden color is, I think, very much a reflection of that experience, going to church, looking at these saints with the halo around them, like ta, -ta. Also kind of ironic too, uh, him being such a holy man and then you have Madonna portraying, uh, no, not Madonna, wait. Um, yeah, Marilyn Monroe portraying <laughs> a sort yeah. of like a symbol in a way, right? For sure, yeah. something that's supposed to be represented as like a holy man. Exactly, exactly, but- it's yeah, but good choice, Alex, for picking this. Okay, and our final presentation will be Yasmin. Yeah, thanks, Maria. Thanks, Alex. Um, I just have a question for all of you. I'm constantly rethinking my name, but if you guys had to rename yourselves without your parents having forced you, what would you name yourselves? <laughs> like if you had to give yourself another name. I like Carlston. I think it's like, I think it's unique. I, I don't, well, it's, it's definitely not like a Joe or like a Nick. I, I like Carlston. I think Carlston's like very different, very unique. I don't know. If you, you were know? a celebrity though? Huh? If you were a celebrity, would you still stay with your name? Yeah, I mean like you have Carlston and then you have like a lot of like celebrities that have like unique names like Rihanna, Beyonce. You don't even need Rihanna's last name. You just know Rihanna and you know like Beyonce. Like, yeah. Yeah. But but, uh, but as a Catholic, growing up as a Catholic, um, I really did not like Maria too much because it was too much pressure. So if I had to, if I had an option, I think I would like to 
be named something different other than Maria. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of have a similar problem, but it's like just mostly because of the pronunciation. I think what Carlson was saying kind of lets us springboard off that because you don't know Beyonce's last name. I mean, you might, but like, you, it's not how you know. Of name them. is Carla. Yeah, you didn't hear that song from Beyonce? I really didn't. <laughs> yes, man. Oops, my bad. I'll, I'll do it after the tour then. Um, but you think of Beyonce, just Beyonce, you don't need a last name. And we think of those as our stage names. So they, there's like the separation between the person themselves and then the person that they present as a celebrity. The thing about Marilyn Monroe, which you might be able to see in the background, my portrait of her right there, um, which we might get back into a little bit later, is that Marilyn Monroe isn't her real name. She, her original name is Norma Jean Baker. Um, but as her fame kind of grew, uh, like, and after her first movie deal with Columbia Pictures, um, they, it was, it was kind of pushed upon her to change her name. Now, um, a lot of things about her aren't necessarily authentic. There's a big difference. Um, she's not actually a blonde, at least not originally. She had mousy brown hair. Um, but then after her, she, her fame again started to grow, there was pressure to dye her hair um, when she was, there's also a rumor about going about how she had a bit of a nose job of the top of her, like her, some of the cartilage in her nose was actually removed as well as her widow's peak. There's also rumor she might've had a chin implant. Um, she, a lot of the image, the beauty that she presented was artificial. Um, and she recognized that. And as Alex was kind of talking about like there, how much of how people thought of her was defined by other people that's kind of where the frustration lies. The way that they kind of liked her wasn't the real her. Um, she was always beautiful, but she wasn't quite Hollywood standards. And as she, her fame grew, so did her anxieties to the point where she was found, uh, she couldn't hold a steady relationship. Alex mentioned her, um, her relationship to JFK, but there's also the series of failed marriages. Um, she was very known for being abusing drugs until that's how she died from a drug overdose in 1962. And if we can move to the next picture, Maria. Okay, what do you guys see immediately? What stands out? The scratched up photo, the black scratches. That's like, yeah. The, the black and white contrast and like the color, color and black. Mm -hmm. This really, in, like this really intense juxtaposition. Um, For me, the division, the cut in the middle, yes. Yeah. You were talking, um, yeah, yeah, Alex? Uh, and how um, on the black and white side, how her face is slowly fading away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Maria, you were saying that Andy was a religious man growing up. I'm Correct. Okay, so the diptych, which is what this is, um, is a very common uh, form of Christian art, particularly found in the medieval eras. There's also the triptych, but the diptych and the triptych, both of these forms of art, they were meant to fold in, fold out. They represented idols. Um, a lot of scenes from the Bible were represented. Here you have the crucifixion um, when he, uh, Jesus was attached to the cross. It's very intense imagery. And if we can go back to the Maryland diptych, this image was created after her death. Um, after her drug overdosed, um, he made some, of, he, he had painted her throughout his life, but this one was made specifically after her death. With that kind of knowledge in mind, how, what meaning does the image begin to take on? Um, I kind of see it as her personality. She's like thriving and um, she's on top of the world. And then as it slowly starts to fade and she starts to like have anxiety and doubt herself and then fall under society's standards to the point where she couldn't take it anymore. Yeah, um, a lot of her anxieties. There's also this kind of, this image that he uses on the gold, if you could zo zoom into just that, Maria. 
uh, that image is very popular. It's the one you saw in er the earlier image for Alex, um, but it's also the one that would be seen around. It was a publicity photo that was very much used and thought of when people thought of Marilyn Monroe. Um, and when you have it as both like very repetitive, this is a like a repetitive piece. There's no kind of, the only difference, especially on the black and white side is that it becomes more faded as times goes on. Um, so if, yeah, if we can just go back to the dipstick, sorry. There is this kind of worshipness, like there's, she, we worship her um, because she's represented in the same way Christian idols would have been represented. There's this religious devotion attached to the way that we view our celebrity. And if you think about kind of our celebrity obsessed culture right now, how people, how there are more people following like Kim Kardashian than there are maybe following like social activists. Um, what do you think um, Warhol was trying to say about the way we perceive these symbols and these one dimensional personas in our daily life? Well, I mean, for me, when I see multiple images like this, I think about consumerism and being used and being brought, bought, like purchased, actually purchased. Mm -hmm. So even human are actually purchased too. So it adds many different layers of meaning for me. Mm -hmm. I think you're right in terms of the being bought, because like Alex was saying, she was objectified throughout her life. Um, people so solely saw her as a body. And she, but again, that body and that kind of persona was artificial. Well, I just, I think that it's like this representation how like Norma Jean's gone and like the new Marilyn Monroe is here. And I feel like it's the same thing with Andy Warhol, really. Like you saw, you've seen him getting bullied by because of his nose and everything. He, and shown through the pictures, he's eventually changed. He's changed his style and everything. His hair was different, everything. I feel like it's the same concept applying to Marilyn Monroe. When you have like society pressuring someone to be, to look like a certain way, when society makes you look like a certain way, Marilyn's the culmination of all that. I think that there's one, I think that you're right and that the idea is you kind of unites these two, the way that we perceive our, the people in public image. But I think that there's this strong distinction. If we can go back to the Andy Warhol painting, uh, selfie, Maria. Like what? his, his multiple one. selfies, the multiple selfies with his wigs. Yeah, this one here. Yeah, um, they're different images. They're different versions of him, as opposed to the diptych, which is solely focusing on this one way that Marilyn Monroe is perceived. And like Maria said, she's commercialized, she's objectified, she is a product to be bought. Norma Jean, like you said, is gone. This is Marilyn Monroe, and this is the way that we view her. Of course, that's not true of every artist. Um, can you move on to the image of Richard Hamilton, please? Yes. Yes. So, Richard Hamilton. We were talking about pop art earlier. He was one of the other earlier prop, uh, proponents of pop art. And he was a painter, a collage artist. He was heav heavily influenced by many artists throughout his lifetime. Um, for one, uh, Duch uh, we had Duchamp. Um, if we could go to the image of him. Most of him know, uh, know him of the fountain, but he was this artist that kind of contested ideas in his art, as opposed to having like representations or accurate depictions. His thing was taking ideas and then questioning them. And his art, that's what his art did. He was also influenced by James Joyce, the famous Irish writer, one of the uh, one like, accredited with kind of the birth of liter liter modernist literature, um, famous for the short story. Hamilton himself was did the illustrations for James Joyce's book, Ulysses. Um, so Hamilton, if we want to go to self-portrait, yeah, he was focused on pop culture in the same way Andy Warhol was. He produced work that tried to define his culture, tried to define the ideas represented in his culture. Um, and that's where you can kind of see the influences of these different artists. Uh, do you want to like look at his self-portrait? Yeah, okay. What do you guys immediately notice? It's pretty intense. It's marked over his face. He spilled paint while painting his thing. He spilled paint on his face. 
Yeah, I mean, it kind of reminds me of the um, piece he did here. Like, I guess, I don't know, I was thinking about the camouflage and even this piece. Mm -hmm. There's some similarities to that marking over Hamilton's face there. Mm -hmm. um, if we want to look at the next self-portrait image. This one here? Yeah. Alex, what are you th thinking about that one? Um, I think that it was quickly drawn. And if I didn't know it was Andy Warhol, I would not have guessed that it was him. Oh, um, just to be clear, sorry for anyone that's confused. This is Richard Hamilton self-portrait. Oh, yeah. Okay. But they are very similar in their kind of, because one, they were both involved in pop art, but two, both of them kind of, they weren't so attached to the idea of accurate depiction. Um, there's this deconstruction of his face. Uh, <laughs> Carlson says it looks like pink spilled over the image, but it's kind of the, the case. It definitely is like very quick. The um, brush strokes are very fast, sharp, almost temporal. Like there's not, there's no permanence kind of attached to it. And this is on the cover of Time Magazine, which is something that we should be thinking about. Um, he also did a painting, uh, did a collage of Marilyn Monroe after her death. It had struck a lot of artists in different ways. This was the way that it struck him. Um, can we go to the image of my Marilyn, please? Thank you. Now, what's different from this image of Marilyn's, of Marilyn versus the one that Andy Warhol did? Or maybe even more simpler, what immediately strikes you? The X's. The X, X's. Mm -hmm. What about you, Alex? Um, I also noticed the X's and there's X's except for that one photo in the bottom right corner. Mm -hmm. And it looks like he's smiling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's happy. Yeah. So the collage itself is by Richard Hamilton. Like I said, he's a painter and also a collage artist. The photos are from this uh, this issue of Town Magazine, um, in which came, Town Magazine, yeah, that came out in November 1962, three months after her death. Um, and the photographs themselves were by George Barris, not by Richard Hamilton. This collage came three years after her death, as opposed to the three months of which these images came out. Um, and so there's this, it still shows the profound impacts of this death carried through, despite the three year time difference. Um, he, in 1964, Hamilton photographed the images from the magazine um, in what, I don't know if you, us from the younger generation will be able to recognize what these are. Um, do you guys recognize the type of photo? I think Alex Carlston, does it look familiar to you? Have you seen this sort of layout of photographs before? No, I'm a simple guy. I just post one picture at a time, you know? <laughs> I don't really do collages like these. Anything too complicated, that's like a no-zone no territory for me. Alex, what about you? No? But I, I do know what you mean. I, I have a lot of friends that do pictures like this. What about you, Alex? never edited a photo like that. I feel like I've seen I it, like, like but I don't know what it's called. Here it is. You you can find it on Canva, I'm pretty sure, like any type of like photo editing thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I think Instagram actually has one of these feature as filter, like context <laughs> sheets. These are called context sheets. <laughs> so when you use 35 millimeter camera, not your smartphone camera, um, there's this feature on there as a filter on Instagram. It looks like a film strip. Do you see the holes on the top, the white, right? So, so go ahead, Yasmin. So you're talking to talking about this context sheet. Yeah. Reference to my Marilyn. Yeah. So he comprised four black and white contact prints, but marked by the actress, and then a full size version of the photograph. Um, and then he repeated this image in various dimensions. You can see some of them are big, some of them are small, some of them are on top of one another, some of them are under one another, um, and especially on the rejected shots um, in various shades of oil paint. Um, in the original, it repeats in two different dimensions. 
which kind of contrasts really well to Andy Warhol's diptych, which only represents Marilyn in one dimension. He, however, shows her in multiple. So you mean like here with the uh, Christianity, yeah. the crucifixion? There's, in Andy Warhol, he kind of represents her as this one kind of layered person, persona. It's very flat. Here, however, she has, she takes on multiple meanings. What do you guys immediately associate with the X? Well, for me, when I zoom in here, the white one where she has the arms out, mm -hmm. um, the way she's posing, it looks like that cross to me. Just because we looked at that diptych, so it's in my mind already. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's because all of the um, images that are crossed out shows her like posing, except for the one where she isn't well, she looks genuinely happy. So I guess they're crossing out what society thinks of her versus what um, she thinks of herself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that, Alex. I like it. Yeah, that's, you, are you sure you didn't do research about this beforehand? Because I have a quote by the artist and that's exactly what he says. <laughs> well, yeah, you can see in a way too, it's not really like an X on her body. If you look at the Xs, they're all like near her body, really close to her body or like away from her body, like the one on the bottom left. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, that's why I agree with Alex too. It's not really about her. It's what like other people think about her. Yeah. So I'm going, there's a quote by um, Richard Hamilton in which he says, the violent obliteration, which is what that X is, of her own image has a self-destructive implication that made her death all the more poignant. My Marilyn starts with her signs and elaborates the possibilities they suggest. Um, Carlson might understand this refer at reference. Um, what's the famous uh, line that comes from Gossip Girl? I haven't watched Gossip Girl in like five months. Come on, it's been there. So wait, hold on. It, Is it um, um, watch Gossip Girl, so I don't know. No, as XOXO, Sorry, Gossip Gossip Alex, Girl. XOXO Gossip Girl. So the X, what else does that represent, guys? Kiss. A kiss, yeah. And when you think of Marilyn Monroe as a sex symbol, what other meaning does this begin to take place? That she is. Yeah, it's not just this violent obliteration of her own image, but there's also this child symbol for the kiss. So there's a way that she destroyed her image, but also how the public did, how by kind of kissing. This is confirmed by Hamilton. I swear this isn't like, this sounds like it's a really far grasp, but apparently this is also what he attended. Um, that there's this kiss upon her, even beyond her death. That's how people perceived her. Um, the, what about the color palette, guys? What does the pink kind of do for you? It's very pink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone you know, else? This is why I feel like um, the, his picture for Hamilton's picture before uh, in front of the Times, I feel like it was simple on purpose. Like, the, like it being simple, like the thing about society is that it could judge you on like whatever you do. Like you can wear black out and and then society will still judge you. I feel like Times being a very urban newspaper source and him having a simple black and white, not too detailed image kind of relate to each other. Yeah. I want to qu give a quick shout out to Layla, who is, seems to really be enjoying um, the presentation so far. Thank you, Layla. We really appreciate you coming. Um, we love you, Layla. Yeah, love Thank you, Lily. We love you. <laughs> and Alex, you know her too. <laughs> Hi, Lily. Okay. Um, yeah, so the pink also, um, not only is this this traditional color for femininity, but there's also a kind of reference to the American billboards, the pinup goddesses, the best selling posters of these woman um, in which they're kind of characterized by their femininity. Um, in this image, uh, Richard Hamilton also takes a lot of influence from de Kooning, if we can see de Kooning's image right here. Yep, uh, <laughs> let me, this one mm -hmm. I chose in particular just because the color were somewhat similar. Yeah. Um, for de Kooning, when he did pit, take uh, 
kind of the inspiration from de Kooning. Um, it wasn't just from, I think it was from a specific painting that he did about um, American male forward and pinup goddesses, but also just using the woman, um, this very famous nude that kind of contested what had previously been the canon in art. This is a supposed to be a kind of caricature of how people, women are kind of objectified and their body is kind of taken as a way of like, in, it, it's, there is a commentary made on kind of the male gaze here. Um, it, you wouldn't be able to tell it's a woman immediately, but you, if you look really closely, you can make out the sex organs, you can make out the face, but it's not particularly attractive. Do you guys see any similarities between this and then um, Hamilton's self-portrait? This, you mean? Mm -hmm. Or the one before? This one here? Yeah. And with the de Kooning? Mm -hmm. You're going to have to explain again, sis. Um, <laughs> Kind of I, 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 agree. I agree. Somehow my mind dozed out. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Any similarities between the way that de Kooning kind of depicts women in this image and then the way that Hamilton depicts himself, but also Marilyn. You guys can take it your choice. So between this and this, mm -hmm. um, I mean, for me, Marilyn looks so playful that there's no bad feelings of any kind here. Here I see aggress aggressiveness in de Kooning, William de Kooning's painting. And I mean, for the fact that I know a little bit more about de Kooning and how he had a very over-dominating mom in his life. Mm -hmm. So I think that frustration definitely is shown here using all women as his, you know, <laughs> yeah. to show that anger or that frustration in these harsh brush strokes, right? Maria, that was good. The, okay. Um, yeah, so it, de Kooning and both Hamilton kind of take their turn in deconstructing images in their depiction. It's not like an accurate reality, but it shows something greater about the way um, or it, it attaches itself more to the meaning. For them, if we go back to my Marilyn for one last time before we move on, there's a kind of poetic justice to it. Uh, Harleston, I know you've been doing SAT prep. What does the possessive pronoun my imply? Personal, like what's it called? Your own, my? Mm -hmm. so, in, so in the diptych, again, I'm gonna bring it up. In the diptych, we have this image that's repeated. It's constantly repeated in different colors, um, but it's the same image. There's no, uh, the Maryland diptych, there's no kind of difference. There, it's, it's accessible to everyone. Um, there are different versions of Maryland, but it's the same. It's repeated, she's objectified, she's commercialized. But in Hamilton's image, he stakes a claim to the myth. He takes her as an individual. This, of course, it might be a bit, can, it's a bit iffy because Marilyn, again, is not her real name, but he takes her as who she is. He sees her as an image. And if you look at the one image that she isn't crossed out in, the smiling one, you can see which image or version of Marilyn he stakes the claim to. There's this disconnect between an audience and the celebrity persona they engage with, but Hamilton and Warhol managed to make this commentary on the way that we kind of think about our celebrities to a way that feels very relevant to now. Yeah. Okay, what about um, Kim Kardashian? Yeah, what about Kim Kardashian? I don't- the Bronzer, love, <laughs> love, the, love the mascara. Just you in this one. What exactly is her talent? I want to say it, but like. <laughs> I know so many quotes on her. Oh my God. <laughs> Alex, feel free to jump in. <laughs> um, Can she, like, what's it called? Stand a glass, a, a, a glass of wine on her thing? No. Can't she, like, put a glass there and it'll, like, hold? Uh, there was, like, really, this really famous, like, picture of her doing that. 
I'm being so serious. Like after she got plastic surgery, she had like a glass on her. I don't know, but I know, I mean, Yasmin, you wanted me to include this image. Yeah, because, I, because again, you kind of asked the question I was hoping to ask. What about um, Kim Kardashian? She is one of those individuals that is famous for some reason. No one knows which reason. Well, some of us know which reason, but we're <laughs> there. Kim Kardashian is another version of a sex symbol in our culture. She's known for her kind of attractiveness, her appeal. But again, a lot of it is artificial. Um, she's known for the many plastic surgeries she's gotten, the way she's edited herself. If you see images of her prior to her fame, there's a great difference. Um, but she's another one that people kind of attach herself to. There's a difference now because now we have reality TV and social media in which people can advertise their personas. Um, but Kim Kardashian kind of represents this climb that we've come from Marilyn Monroe in which now it's not just the sexual attractiveness, but the personality that's kind of being sold as a commodity. It's kind of being objectified, commercialized. And it's something that we should be thinking about as we kind of continue to engage with celebrities and culture, not only in our social justice or brands and body image, but especially in our politics because these people hold great influence and it's up to us as a public to give it, to kind of give it to them. Wow, I agree with you. That is, that's really, um, that's a lot to think about. But I keep going back to, I don't know, uh, those, of, those of you who are still with us on YouTube, I don't know if any one of you missed this polling. We would like to revisit this again. And if you could write A, B, and C, whatever your choice that draws you and um, use the chat box. Like Lily, which one would you choose? A, like you, celebrity culture influence you more in politics or body image or voice for social change. Let us know or whoever's tuning in with us. Um, yeah, if you could either write A, B and C, that would be great for something um, for us to carry on and have that ongoing discussion. Uh, Lily or Layla? Yeah. She says, see, that's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I said. Yep. I'd yeah. like to kind of change my answer. I'm going to go with B this time instead. B, body image. Wow. That's what Carlston said. Carlston, do you still stick to the same B as the answer? Yeah, B. I don't know why Yasmin chose C. Her whole presentation was about B, so... But no, yeah. Yasmin chose B as a boy. Bo B. No, in the beginning, she chose A. Yeah. Ah, and <laughs> Alex, Alex, does your answer change too or no? Yeah, I'm going to go with C. You tell. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. I really think at the end of the day, Marilyn or Kardashian or um, who, who are we talking about here? They were actually two smart women. Maybe they know how to embrace their flaws almost <laughs> and then use it to their advantage um because after all she, kardashian she's making a lot of money right she's like what i think her her posting she gets how much is she getting you know from endorsing all kinds of product mm -hmm. and brands so um she's definitely a businesswoman in my point of view yeah and um, I also eh, wanted to share silk screening process. We talked about it earlier in case you were, uh, those of you who joined kind of didn't know, like it's a tedious process, but mass produced. And again, pop bar is very much about that. Mass production, consumerism, capitalism, all of the above. <laughs> okay, should I stop screening share so we could have a chat? And I don't know, I'm waiting for any questions that may come our way. Oh, uh, wait, and Lily had wrote something here. Oh, let's read what Lily wrote on YouTube chat. See, because celebrities have more of a voice in social change since they have a big platform. You are right. Since they're icons, lots of people will follow their lead. Yep, Lily, you got it. I am so with that statement because she does have that they all the celebrities have that platform that some of us don't have i mean we're using the youtube platform here today <laughs> to reach out to other audience beyond our medium contact 
but um, certainly that platform is a key word, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I think this kind of sums up, but, um, but it's so interesting to hear all of your perspective, your thoughts on this. Any last comments or um, anything you want to add, Alex, Carlston, Yasmin? I was just gonna wait. I was gonna wait before we end before we end the call so I could say like XOXO gossip girl. Bye. <laughs> like right before we leave the call, I'd be like XOXO gossip girl, peace. <laughs> and then also this, you know, gives some time for anybody else to ask us questions and they're waiting on it. So if we could chat amongst ourselves and in case they have questions for us, then we could check back. Yeah. Um, I would, I'd like to explain the kind of changing the answers because one, it is about brands, especially in terms of Kim K. When we first asked the questions, I was thinking in terms of myself, which in myself is definitely politics. Um, but I am thinking, after we reviewed Marilyn Monroe, I was kind of thinking about how she was kind of also seen as promiscuous because she was so curvy. And for a lot of people, she became the ideal body image, but for another half of the people, she became the opposite. Like I was reading a quote the other day by like this model being like, if I was big as Marilyn Monroe, I'd kill myself or something. Because she was also, um, she had been kind of strayed from the status quo and that she was, curvy she was a bit more full I no, think it's so you know what's so dumb because like if you're like Andy Warhol and you're like the nerdy type you get bullied you're skinny you're fairly you get bullied but when you're like pretty and everything you still get judged regardless so it's kind of like dumb to me yeah but Marilyn Monroe kind of represents a really kind of precarious position a lot of women are in right now in which there is no ideal body shape. You can either be sexy like Marilyn and still be criticized for being too fat or being too thin and not being sexy enough. And she was just, that conflict caused so much anxiety throughout her life. It's no kind of question why she, it, it gives a bit more of an answer as to why she ended it, I guess. But also I find it fascinating that you said you have Marilyn Monroe picture in your bedroom. Yeah, yeah, I definitely do. And why, because you, um, because it was five dollars. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, that's it. That's really it. There's nothing more to it. I mean, she is gorgeous, but I kind of gotten all these images for five dollars. I find it so interesting that she is sold in the same way that the image of the skyline and they're all worth the same value. It's kind of crazy. Just this image of her is just mass produced five dollars. Attraction sensor, I guess. Like all yeah. the things you have on your wall, yeah. Yeah, it's just, a, it, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting for sure. Okay, Alex, you wanna make any last minute statements? Um, I'm okay. Okay, but let me just check back and see if we have any additional comments from anyone, everyone who's watching us. Okay, I think then that sort of wraps up, right? Our virtual art talks for teens and adults. Um, everyone, whoever's still there, um, we have another one scheduled August 22nd. It will be on a completely different topic. So um, if you want to join us on Zoom platform, you can. So we could actually hear you unless you rather stick to YouTube. It's totally up to you. Um, so let us know. And, and whoever joined us, we thank you. So until next time, take thank care. You. Wait, hold on, you guys. Let me stop the um, live session now. XOXO, gossip girl. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs>